Uh, it is my honor now to introduce our presiding bishop, Catherine Jeffrey Chory. Uh, how many were here in 2007 for our clergy conference? Uh, about a half were here. Uh, it was my first clergy conference as bishop, and Catherine was here with us. Uh, and this is her last week as presiding bishop. And uh, she has written her statement of gratitude uh, to the whole church. I want to echo that. Uh, I want to echo what she has done for the church. She has said, uh, we are clearer as a church, as the Episcopal Church. I want to echo that seven times or 70 times uh, through her leadership, getting clear about who we are, holding people accountable, uh, bringing people together. Uh, my favorite story of Catherine, uh, this is a, a time when we tell stories, was in 2007 when we were in New Orleans. And the, uh, not the presiding bishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury was invited to come. And he began his remarks to the House of Bishops. It was a tense time, as you might imagine. Began his remarks talking about uh, British and German soldiers being in opposite trenches uh, during World War II. And asked the question, World War I, I'm sorry, in World War I. And the question was asked, how did we get here? which was sort of an interesting way of starting a conversation. And he, he, he talked, uh, and, and he was uh, outlining his, sort of the challenge uh, that we faced as a larger church. After he finished his remarks, Catherine came up. I don't know how she did it, but she said, yes, and on Christmas, they came out of the trench, trenches and sang Christmas carols together. She remembered that story of reconciliation. And she remembered it for all of us, not to be able to say, I know this story. No, but it was a, it was a witness to reconciliation. And since then, and continuing, she has been uh, a model of reconciliation, talking about that in so many different ways, in so many uh, different environments, and has been, in many ways, the embodiment of reconciliation. Uh, we are in the Diocese of Bethlehem as we're here. We're in the Diocese of Newark, but we're in the Diocese of Bethlehem. And there are no end of clergy in this diocese who are grateful for Catherine and her reconciling work here in this diocese. So, uh, in the Diocese of Bethlehem. Catherine, we're so glad you could spend this time with us. So, I give the floor to you. Thank you.
came from a root that really meant to spend time in intimate community. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> That's what it's about. It's about spending enough time in intimate relationship that you come to see the image of God in your neighbor. You come to know that you are God's beloved and that the other person sees you in that way and you see the other person or other people in the conversation in that way. Um, as Christian leaders, I think our task is to build communities like that that are about deep conversation rather than the kinds of verbal battles that we see going on around us under the guise of conversation. Uh, I want to remind you about conversation in the Christian sense and in the biblical sense. Two creation stories in Genesis. God speaks. God speaks creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God keeps speaking, and more things come to be. God gets to the end of the work week. God creates humanity, and God says, it is very good. It is very good. And then God rests. Has conversation, in some sense, with creation on the Sabbath. The second creation story is about what goes wrong what's been created, and the conversation retreats from intimacy, right? Adam and Eve go and hide after they've done something they weren't supposed to do. And the rest of the first part of the Bible is about how things really go down the <laughs> When Jesus starts his public ministry, he goes to the goes to meet his cousin, John, in the Jordan and gets baptized. He comes out of the water and hears the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Good creation, blessed creation, God's beloved. And then what does he do? He goes out into the desert to be tempted. I think it's a very conscious midrash of those two creation stories in the same order, the same, the same um, narrative arc, if you will. Good, blessed creation that retreats from intimacy and goes astray. Only Jesus doesn't go astray. He goes wandering, but he remains in relationship. I think that's the centerpiece of what it means to be engaged in faithful relationship for all of us. Remembering that we are beloved. And if we had time, I would ask you to sit in quiet and reflect on God saying to you, you are my beloved. In you, I am well pleased. I think at the very least, God says that to us when we're baptized. I think God says that to us when we're created. In our mother's womb, as the prophets say. Well, we have known that since before we can remember. But when we retreat from that intimate conversation, what happens? What happens? We forget. <laughs> we get disconnected. Lose our courage. We wither. We become self-centered. We become self-centered rather than centered in the relationship. Yes, yes. It's easier to call them other. You ain't my kid. I think that's absolutely central to what it is to be a leader in the church. And I think all God's people are called to leadership somewhere. To have the courage to stand up and say, this is what I hear and this is where I think we ought to be going. Let's go together. Go together. The church is in a season, the world is in a season of significant transition. I think that's what you've been talking about. 
as a diocese. The root of conversation is the same root as conversion. When we say in that intimate relationship, when we keep turning with another, we have enough vulnerability to be changed. Conversation that's true conversation is mutual, it's open, it's willing to hear what God might be doing in someone else or in some other position. If we retreat from the intimacy of conversation, the ability to be converted or transformed is lost. I think that's a piece of what we're engaged in in getting our congregations out into the community to listen discover where God is at work uh, in the other. The other we don't want to engage because it doesn't feel safe and it's not. It's not meant to be safe. It's meant to be transformative. That's hard and painful work and we can only do it if we remember and keep remembering that we are beloved. If we have a community of Comfort in the ancient sense, strength, reminder that, that we've got what God needs and we're meant to put it to work. We're in a stage in the church's history, um, particularly as the Episcopal Church, when the conflict that we were so consumed by for a couple of decades, really, is behind us. Um, shorthand, the sex wars are over. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, there's a remarkable uh, article in uh, The Living Church that just came out by George Sumner, who will be the next Bishop of Dallas. Uh, he's been in Canada for a couple of decades. Uh, he's very conservative, but he's, he's very clear in saying, I don't agree with the decisions the Episcopal Church has made, but I'm here. And the task now is to remember that minorities need to be recognized and honored. When we are so consumed in our own uh, righteousness, we miss that possibility. And we miss the gift that somebody from another position might have to offer us. I think we're in a, an open enough space as a church right now that we've got the ability to be vulnerable and listen. And I think it's a gift that's meant to be taken out. We've got some work to practice at home, but the work will get, the capacity will get stronger by practicing it elsewhere. Engaging the other in the communities around us. Along with the wars being behind us, um, we have become in the process, I think, a far more multicultural, conscious of our multicultural reality, conscious of our multinational reality, conscious of our multilingual reality, um, conscious of the fact that Episcopalians don't just come in one sort. And the ability to wrestle with that diversity and discover the giftedness in that diversity is a part of that intimate conversation. If we just have um, facade interactions, we don't discover that. Because we're not looking to be changed and we're not looking for transformation in the community, the communities of which we're part. But I think we live in a season where there is a just an incredible possibility for faithful people to be engaged in communities around us that don't know much about good news. 
or where we might not see the good news until we get into the midst of it and discover how it's emerging and be transforming ourselves in the process. That's beginning to happen. And part of what I want to do during my time with you is explore some of the ways in which that's happening. I think it's incredibly exciting. Um, I think you're going to get told the possible <coughs> stories yourselves. I hope. Let me, let me just give some examples. Um, our engagement with the SBNRs, spiritual but not religious, <laughs> or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the ones without habits, the nuns who could use to learn some spiritual habits, perhaps, often are hungry for practice, but don't know how to go about it. It's one of the reasons that yoga and other kinds of um, martial arts or embodied um, ritual practices have become so current. Where people have ordered freedom, right? We can't be creative without some order. And that's what the body practice offers. That's what spiritual discipline and all kinds of spiritual practices are about. And to build a container where creativity can flourish, to build that kind of intimate space for conversation where we can be transformed. Does that make sense? I think we all know about that, at least we've learned about it somewhere in our history, and our challenge almost always is the, the desire to retreat from that kind of challenging intimacy of being transformed, um, because it's hard, it's hard work. And it's always changing. Even if you say the office day by day by day by day by day by day by day, it changes. And the need, the needs we have change in the midst of that discipline. But it's a discipline for a reason. We're, we're awakening to the needs and possibilities for Reconciliation of all sorts within the church and beyond it. Um, I'm struck by the way in which kind of traditional Anglo congregations and traditional African American congregations that stay inwardly focused um, just kind of have all the wind sucked out. They're like the Episcopal Church was 15 years ago, five years ago, engaged in the heat of the internal conflict without much awareness of what's going on around us or creative possibility around us because we, you know, like Adam and Eve, we're hiding in the bushes. <laughs> it's easier to do that than engage with the powerful stuff that's going on and fighting about where the coffee pot is or what time of service it is <laughs> is a great diversion. <clears throat> but life is a whole lot more interesting elsewhere. <laughs> Engaging with the real stuff. It's dangerous. It will call things out of us that we didn't know would ever be asked of us. And it will call things from our congregations that they're not sure they want to do or try. That's where life is. Evangelical creativity. Some of the amazing things that people have tried. The Diocese of Los Angeles, and some of you have probably heard about this, somebody noticed that homeless people didn't have any place to wash their clothes. So a congregation decided they were going to get some quarters of laundry detergent and clean bags and go down to the laundromat and wash clothes for people, or help people wash their clothes. They called it laundry love. <laughs> and it was powerful enough that a community began to gather there on a regular basis. They began to worship together, and they ordained a priest to serve in that congregation in the laundromat. <laughs> they ordained a priest in the laundromat. 
but it took the courage to get out into the community and to listen, to meet people that don't normally come to Episcopal churches on Sunday, and to find out what they were hungry for. <coughs> and we are called, called to feed people, aren't we? That hunger comes in lots of different forms. Um, a year and a half ago, I was in, I was in New York uh, at the office on a Sunday without a gig, and I wandered across the river to Brooklyn and went to a congregation that had been in existence about two months. I was meeting in a music venue, a place that's a bar during the week. On the sidewalk in front of the place, it was a sign that said, Bushwick Abbey, church that doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> the Sunday I went there, um, the, the priest uh, had blue hair that Sunday and tattoos. I think she has tattoos all the time. <laughs>
conversation that is intimate enough, we begin to hear the joys and laments and yearnings of the people who are there. And out of that develops the possibility of what some would call an evangelical encounter, an opportunity for good news. But if a congregation says, well, our job here is to have church at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and to do it in the same way we've been doing it for 50 years, um, there's not much opportunity for that intimate conversation. And Episcopalians still often expect that new Episcopalians will turn up in church on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to say that we depended on evangelism by reproduction. <laughs> it worked in the 50s and 60s. It doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> we have to go out and engage. And we have to be creative about it. We have to be willing to go into the wilderness and discover what's there. And remember that we are beloved and held in the midst of that challenging Maybe, maybe this is an appropriate time to do a little more um, talking about opportunities and challenges I see coming, and then, then we can do some storytelling. Um, the Episcopal Church in, as a whole is under two million members, and David Virtue wrote some really helpful stuff about that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, the parts of the Episcopal Church that are growing are most of our overseas diocesan and congregations, most of our immigrant congregations in the US, and congregations everywhere that are turned outward in that kind of intimate conversation with the neighborhood, whether it's the immediate local neighborhood or a neighborhood across the world. About, in the American part of our context, about 40% of Americans say they go to religious services weekly. 40%. Some of them may be uh, not telling the truth. <laughs> but that's a pretty significant number. And it's the same as it was in the 1940s and early 1950s. Before the big um, kind of swell of church going and religious engagement began or developed to its fullest. Um, religious institutions in the U.S. merit more trust from the general public than the White House, than the Supreme Court, than the medical profession. We're behind the police. I find it shocking. Those who attend religious communities regularly I would put to you are far more committed than the average person who crossed the threshold of a synagogue or an Episcopal church or a Roman Catholic church in the 1950s. The average person. Religious membership is no longer socially expected. You don't have to belong to an Episcopal church or a Presbyterian church in order to advance in business the way you did in many contexts 50 years ago. We, we are doing, I think, a, a better job at ongoing formation of members in this church. We've got a lot of room to grow in that reality. Uh, but we're moving toward what I would call a more adult kind of church where we expect that the members are ministers in their daily lives, where we teach people the reality of what the baptismal covenant is about, and where we're beginning to hold people more accountable to living in congruence with that covenant. It's not easy work. It means the church takes a very different shape it may mean that 
vestry meetings run differently? It may mean that the reality of church life within a congregation functions very differently. And I think that's an enormous opportunity for development within this church. It means that we're interdependent, neither independent or dependent or codependent. And I think we're still living with the aftermath of that in many places. I see, I see great not being said. I'm sure you deal with that very good. Human, human communities are a challenge, but they're holier when they're confronted about ways they're not vulnerable. I think it comes back over and over again to this willingness to be an intimate community where we see the belovedness of our conversation partners and we expect them to see our belovedness and along with it goes our vulnerability and yes, our sinfulness. But, but when the community of conversation is healthy, it calls people back to the center. I think that's what people are yearning for in the world around us. Deeply yearning for. I believe that the future of this church is going to be increasingly diverse not just in membership of congregations, but in what congregations look like. I think we're going to see more congregations that either don't have buildings, permanent buildings, or live lightly to them. Um, if buildings are needed, they ought to be used 24-7. They're a resource for ministry. Uh, there are a growing number of congregations that have rent space, that find ways to put that space to use during the week, tutoring programs, community service programs. There are a growing number of congregations that meet on the street, common cathedral. There's, there's a congregation in Atlanta, there's one in Boston, there's several across the country. Uh, I, I was in Venezuela a couple of years ago, and a deacon, the bishop and a deacon took us to meet with a little Haitian congregation, people who had emigrated after the earthquake in Haiti and were now living in Venezuela. Uh, and the deacon had come from Haiti to serve them. They met in an upstairs room of a little tenement building that was barely reachable on foot. That building gets used for teaching, or Christian teaching and school teaching, when it's not being used otherwise. I think we're going to see more congregations that don't meet on Sunday morning. St. Lydia's Dinner Church in Manhattan, some of you are aware of that. Started by a Lutheran pastor, um, it's Lutheran Episcopal at this point. They meet to cook dinner, it's mostly young adults, on Sunday nights and Monday nights. <coughs> different people come different times. It began as a feeding ministry that developed into a worshiping community. <coughs> if you've read Sarah Miles' book, Take This Bread, similar kind of personal conversion story for her, she was a, an unbelieving reporter, journalist, who went to look at what St. Gregory Nyssa was up to, uh, and she took communion. Oh. <laughs> and she, she, she was converted by that experience and became a food minister in that community, feeding the people from the same table on which they made We don't have the opportunity to experience those kinds of things unless we're willing to be engaged out there. 
and I think that's the hardest part. Um, for a number of our members getting out into the community with people they don't know, um, with people they uh, assort, they find very <coughs> scary. Um, but it's, it's what we need to be. For our own spiritual health and for the spiritual health of our communities. Katrina was an amazing experience in that regard. And it was a piece of the, you know, the sex wars that began to convert people. You know, when I was down there several times, I'd meet people who came from really conservative parts of the church and very progressive parts of the church, and they were working together, mucking out somebody's house or rebuilding something, and they discovered they had way more in common than they thought. They were serving somebody else. They weren't fighting about what they disagree about. I think that's the way of the gospel. I think it's one reason why mission trips have become so significant. I think there are more effective ways to do that than others. Some of them are more effective than others. But it's getting people out of their familiar, safe contexts to meet people and to be, to be vulnerable in the experience. Going to a different environment, meeting people you don't know, um, living cheek by jowl with people you don't know very well, eating weird food, getting sick together, hammering <laughs> a few nails, uh, pulling luggage through the airport and enduring uh, unforeseen circumstances. <clears throat> Canterbury Tales, right? <laughs> Pilgrims. Pilgrims. We can do that in our own neighborhoods. I think that seminary trained leadership is going to be used very differently in this church in coming years and decades. I think we need professional, professionally formed and professionally trained and thoroughly formed clergy in this church. But I think they're going to be used somewhat differently. I think we're going to see fewer congregations that will support a full-time pastor for that congregation alone. If we're serious about the theology of this middle-aged prayer book, I believe it means building mutual relationships of leadership in congregations. Seeing that every member of the congregation is a minister, mostly in the world, some of them with ministries in the church, in the congregation. We're already shifting that kind of leadership, and we're in the midst of it. We're in the midst of a difficult transition. I think we're going to see more of those professionally trained clergy serving multiple congregations as a support, with much of the leadership happening locally in those congregations. Clustered congregations is one example, but the, the, the trained person can be a resource for the ongoing development of leaders in those congregations. I think we're going to see congregations that look like several um, cells, perhaps multicultural cells, um, perhaps different age cohorts, perhaps meeting at different times during the week. There was a church in England a couple of years ago whose ancient stone building was falling down around their ears. And they, at some point, decided they were just going to let it do that. And they were going to move out and meet in homes, a number of different ones, and come together every couple of weeks in the parish hall for a check-in session, meal, worship, training formation. It's, it's a way of listening deeply to what's going on in that community and finding the grace to find a new way. I think we're going to see more house churches, particularly in rural areas, particularly in air, urban areas where employment um, is 24-7. 
it, it's one way to respond to the need for formation in community uh, that isn't possible when people can't come or don't come to church on Sunday morning for three hours. Right? It's also an ancient part of our tradition. We haven't thought about building churches as labras, as little monastic cells that come together on a regular basis. I think that's an eminently possible part of our future. Let me say a little bit about multicultural congregations. Um, I was in Los Angeles right after General Convention for a reconciliation event that brought together the Primate of Japan and the Primate of Korea. Um, together we've been working on reconciliation over the Korean Peninsula uh, for the last seven or eight years. Um, but that congregation where we met is a traditionally Japanese American congregation in what is has been a Korean neighborhood and is now becoming a Latino neighborhood. And they have members from all three of those cultural communities and they have some Anglos. <coughs> Uh, it's a very challenging reality. Um, the, the Japanese part of the congregation is shrinking um, and aging. Uh, the Korean part of the congregation is younger and still pretty engaged. The Latino part of the congregation is much younger, has lots of children, uh, and is transient in the sense that people don't stay very long. Uh, the leadership of that congregation is developing some amazing uh, community and responsiveness to the reality of the larger, the larger community. Um, multicultural congregations like that are a real challenge, but when well done, they, they are incredibly vibrant. You know, biologists would talk about hybrid vigor. <laughs> Um, more traditional congregations that tend to be somewhat more monocultural, because none of us are. None of our congregations really are monocultural. They hide their diversity beyond, behind sort of appearing to be the same. And they hide the conflict behind that as well. The, the reality of a multicultural congregation is that the, con the conflict is front and center, and it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for discovering the belovedness on the face of neighbor. It's an opportunity for that kind of deeply intimate conversation that doesn't happen in more staid communities. There's enough chaos in the midst of it that we know God's speaking something new in the beast. I want to tell you some stories about um, indigenizing, <laughs> which is my language for it. Um, seeing how the church takes its context seriously. Um, does Roland Allen, does that name ring any bells? Yes. 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 Good. Um, he was a, an Episcopal missionary in China in the latter part of the 1800s and the early 1900s. And he said, our job is to do what Paul did, to go into a community with scripture and sacraments, and then get out of the way. Um, let, let the gospel grow in native soil and become what it needs to be in that soil. Uh, he and Henry Venn were proponents of the sense that a maturing church is supposed to be self-governing, self-propagating, and self-sustaining. It's really the image of what a, an adult church is, in, in the sense that we're supposed to grow up into the full stature of Christ. We're not supposed to be dependent on others for the sake of being dependent, or because we're too lazy to you know, take on our own mature ministries. Um, but that's the goal. Nobody ever reaches it fully, but that's the journey that we're on as community. Um, I think that's a piece of what indigenizing church is. 
we're going to take seriously the, God, the gifts God has given us in place and take seriously the context and put our gifts to work in that context and see what God does with it. And not um, cry because we don't have you know, all the goodies we want or um, all the kudos we want. Um, we're just going to go do, do what we're supposed to do and be who we're supposed to be in this place. Uh, the Episcopal Church is blessed with being present in 17 different countries, and we're responsible for um, helping to start the Anglican tradition in a number of other provinces in the communion, some of which used to be part of the Episcopal Church, like Brazil, Mexico, Central America, the Philippines, and Liberia. And we sent missionaries to China and Japan, and in some sense, we got out of the way. Uh, we didn't do it perfectly by a long shot. Um, we, we sent Cuba off to be by itself, and I, I learned more about this just a few weeks ago, um, to be autonomous sort of overnight in the late 60s when our governments were <laughs> doing unhelpful things. Uh, and they have no resources. They have been incredibly uh, creative in becoming more sustainable Christian community in an environment where that's pretty impossible. And the government has actually figured out that the church can do things that the government can't. And so the government's gotten out of the way to a large extent, not completely, but a large extent. But that's, that's one example. Um, the, the church in Taiwan, which is our diocese farthest west, um, has a significant <coughs> ministry of bilingual kindergartens. That's how they're present in a part of the world where there aren't a lot of Christians. Uh, that's how they make sense of their environment for people who aren't Christians. And that's how they serve uh, parents and families who are eager to have their children grow up speaking English. They take tender care of those children and teach them Christian values along with their English. Um, the Episcopal churches in Micronesia are on Guam and Saipan. And they started there as the church did in Taiwan and um, with military presence. Uh, the church in Guam runs a school that receives boarders from all around the Pacific Rim. Uh, and has three, had three congregations which have since consolidated that minister to American military families, uh, to local residents, and to some of the indigenous peoples, the Chuk, uh, in Micronesia. The church on Saipan ministers primarily with Filipino guest workers who are effectively slaves in that context. It's the only place those people have to seek support inside man. Those are examples. Um, San Diego, and this has happened in a couple of dioceses. San Diego, uh, a year ago, opened a new diocesan center in a church where the congregation had been closed. Um, the church building was redundant, as the English would say. Uh, and they decided to turn it into a community center and diocesan center, where they have meetings, uh, they have a community, community services for the low-income people of the surrounding area, and out of that is beginning to grow a worshiping congregation. But a worshiping congregation is not the primary reason for that ministry's existence. Uh, I was there for their convention at the same time, I've never seen something like this, quite like this, happen. At the end of convention, they sent the delegates out with paper bags, with the lunch, you know, staples, you know, a can of tuna that you could open easily and eat, a bottle of water, um, some other snacks, bag of blessings. And people were encouraged to, when they saw a panhandler in a median, to stop and give a bag of blessings and to take that ministry home as a concrete way of beginning that conversation with people in the community you probably never have a conversation with otherwise. Um, 
Los Angeles has got a credit union that provides banking services in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, that's a ministry that started in a couple of other places in the Episcopal Church. It's an important ministry that, particularly in low-income areas where banking services are often extortionate, uh, I'm serious, uh, um, you, need, you need good uh, legal and financial support to set something like that up, but it's it's a powerful ministry for people who don't have access. You read in the last week or so about um, cards that you can download money onto that weren't available for people for a week. They had no way to buy food because they got their paychecks on these cards. Um, that's an example of a place where a credit union can make a real difference. Um, Los Angeles has also started ministries connected with teaching people how to operate in the food service industry. Um, it started with something called Mama's Hot Tamales uh, that um, helped um, artisanal cooks uh, figure out how to market their wares on the streets. They built a commercial kitchen and helped other groups to get started in the same kind of ministry. You know, that's something that can be done in a parish hall with a renovated kitchen. Uh, provides you know, access for people in the wider community. And it's a way to get your your presence known in the wider community, that you're the sponsor or something like that. Nebraska did something similar in taking their unused Sunday school building next to the church and providing hospitality for community organ organizations that needed office space at a low cost and shared facilities. Um, like a Xerox machine and telephone service, printing services. That, that's another opportunity. The Diocese of Puerto Rico has had a ministry of health care for generations. They run three hospitals that provide a significant fraction of health care in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a diocesan ministry. The cathedral is actually present on hospital property. That's not possible in many parts of the American context anymore. <coughs> um, dioceses are unloading hospitals. Um, but a number of places are starting clinics um, available to all comers, um, homeless people, uh, people who are without health care, even given the Affordable Care Act, um, people with minimal resources. Sometimes they're volunteer clinics, sometimes they're associated with hospital systems. Um, that's another opportunity. Ecuador Central and Ecuador Litoral have a long <coughs> history of ministry with schools. Uh, the reality is that in much of Latin America, the governments are taking over private schools, insisting that all, all students are educated equally um, or according to the same rules. Uh, but they continue to seek ways to provide for the support of students, like after school programs or feeding programs or parental encouragement um, to participate in schools. Um, you have relationships with Haiti? Any of you? Haiti has the, is the largest diocese in the Episcopal Church. Over 100,000 Episcopalians. <laughs> Uh, 254 schools, 169 congregations, about 40 clergy. They do amazing work, absolutely amazing work. Uh, they figured out how to build schools for which they receive small fees from parents, um, oftentimes with a UTO grant to build the first couple of classrooms. And then they use the fee income to finish the school over a number of years. And then the income from the school supports some of the life of the parish as well. So it's, a, it's a, a mutual benefit kind of arrangement. Uh, the priest is usually the, the educator, the, the overseer of the school, um, employs the teachers, and oversees the governments of the school. Uh, it's yet another model. We often spin off our schools. Um, or we have difficult relationships with the school because we haven't figured out how to marry the governance structures. Uh, so 
something to think about. Uh, in the Dominican Republic, uh, the social ministry looks often like um, agricultural support and teaching, um, schools again, health clinics. Uh, there's an order of nuns down there that maintains a senior home for people who are, not, are unable to be cared for by their families but need essentially nursing care. Uh, some of you are aware of the challenge of the migration issues between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, Haitians were imported basically as uh, almost as slave labor in the 20s and 30s to the Dominican Republic to work in the sugarcane industry in the fields. Uh, generations have lived in the Dominican Republic and a, a couple of years ago the Dominican government said, well, no, you're not citizens, you have no right to be here. Uh, and we're taking away the citizenship of your children and your grandchildren who were born here. Uh, that has, despite the critique of the um, American, um, I forgot the name of it, the Consortium of American Governments, um, basically the UN for the Americas, uh, Organization of American States, um, has said this is illegal according to international law. Uh, it hasn't been resolved, uh, but it's a place where this church has tried to advocate with our government to push on them, on the Dominican government to resolve this in a just way, but the situation continues to be pretty rigid. Um, an indigenous ministry that is indigenous in both senses, uh, in the 1920s, the Bishop of Alabama then heard that there were some Native Americans living in the swamp down on the Florida Gulf Coast. Um, and he sent a missionary in to try to find out what was going on. And the priest went there and spent time and got to know the Creek Indians who were living there, the Porch Creek Band. Uh, and discovered that they prayed, they said their morning prayers in the river, in the river. And eventually a number of the members of the tribe were baptized. And the records of those baptisms let the Porch Creek Band apply for federal recognition in the 60s. And it was the grounds for them being recognized as a tribe. Uh, when they were recognized, they had no land. And the diocese gave a piece of land to them for the first part of their reservation, their own whole base of land. It's an amazing story. Um, let's see. I mentioned self-sustainability as part of the maturing church image. Uh, there are four indigenous dioceses or dioceses in the Episcopal Church that have large indigenous populations of Native Americans who are on the church-wide budget, um, have received grants from the church-wide budget for indigenous ministry for years. Alaska, Navajo Land, and the two Dakotas. Um, as a result of part of the work that's been going on in Province 9, which is Latin American dioceses, over the last six or seven years, the indigenous dioceses have also begun to look at self-sustainability, um, the future of their ministry in those dioceses. It's something that I think the more settled parts of the church, the American, other American parts of the church, have something to learn from. They're looking at how to sustain this ministry into the future, um, not just about how to survive this year, but how to build a model of ministry that's sustainable for the long term. Uh, people have to be creative. Uh, it may look like schools in Haiti that provide some funds to sustain the parish as the parish sustains the life of the school. Uh, Navajo Land is looking at um, developing some water sources that can be provide income. Uh, they're looking at aquaponics <coughs> projects. So is the Handicapped Children's Project in Port-au-Prince in Haiti, uh, food sources. Uh, there are creative ways that your gifts can be put to use to sustain and grow the ministry in the place. Um, Asset-based community development, does that ring any bells? Yes. 
that the piece is what, what this draws off. Um, you look at your, your gifts, um, and you, you, you build on those gifts rather than what's absent. It, it, it comes from a stewardship model of gratitude and generosity rather than want. Some creative images of schools. Uh, the Diocese of Massachusetts has started a couple of middle schools that take underperforming students, usually a couple of years below grade level in fifth grade, and keep them through eighth grade with a very intensive family education and support model uh, that says we're going to deal with the whole system and not just an individual student. Um, when these kids graduate from 8th grade, they're uh, performing often at ninth and 10th grade often. And they go back into high schools where, where they flourish, absolutely flourish. Uh, it's a model that's resource intensive, both financially and in terms of personnel, but it changes the community um, in, in incredible ways. There's another one in Washington uh, called the Bishop Walker School for Boys. Uh, that, that also does this, this kind of work, beginning with preschool, and they're growing year by year, and I think they're up to the sixth grade at this point. Uh, life changing, community changing. North Carolina has a remarkable farm worker ministry. It's a cooperative uh, between two dioceses, working with migrant workers, um, most of whom are Latino come to work in the crops, some settle in the area, but most travel on to other parts of the eastern United States following the crops. Uh, they have a, it's the largest worshiping congregation in the Diocese of North Carolina. Uh, they gather hundreds of people on, on a Sunday. They're bussed in from a number of different camps. Uh, they worship in a place like this without walls, as a roof, but no walls. Um, and other, other kinds of services are provided along with the liturgical service. There may be haircuts, um, legal assistance, uh, food, food support, um, medical support. Um, it's a holistic kind of ministry that, that could be applied and adapted in all sorts of places. And as you know, um, Gardens are flourishing all over the place. Um, dig up your lawn. Dig up your lawn and turn it into productive green space. <laughs> it changes the neighborhood. And I've heard, heard some stories here tonight about ways in which the neighbors discover the church through the garden that is growing food next door. It is, you know, what did Jesus do? He fed people. He taught people. He healed people. Um, gardening and food ministry does that in spades. I think the last thing I will talk about in terms of an example is what's going on in Delaware, but also in Rhode Island right now. The cathedral buildings are being converted into other kinds of ministries. Um, Delaware is going to become housing for low-income and moderate-income seniors. And Rhode Island's former cathedral is being turned into a racial reconciliation center. Um, the traces of the trade came out of Rhode Island. Um, remarkable examples of repurposed uh, resources for community ministry. 